Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to Neo Metals webinar. This is Trevor Brucato with RB Milestone Group, the US based investor relations firm. Neo Metals is listed in Australia on the ASX under the symbol NMT. And as of today, the company is now listed on the OTCQX in the US under the symbol NMTAY. Joining us today is the company's managing director and CEO, Chris Reed will be providing an introduction to the Neo Metal story. Following Chris's presentation, we'll be addressing questions that have been submitted during registration and those submitted live. If you are interested in asking a question, you can submit them in the Zoom Q&A module. Please note this presentation is being recorded today, May 15th, 2024, and will be made available on the company's website at neometals.com.au. Following today's event, the company's investor survey will go live and will be emailed to all stakeholders. The results will develop trends on Neometal's perceived strengths, weaknesses, and milestones, and will be very helpful in strengthening the company's investor communications efforts and guide the focus of upcoming events. So your participation will be much appreciated. Please note today's presentation may, presentation may contain forward-looking statements that are subject to risks and uncertainties, that may be out of Neo Metals control and should not be construed as a recommendation or solicitation to buy or sell any security. The company's full disclaimer can be found in their presentation and on their website. Lastly, RBMG is not a registered investment advisor or broker dealer. For more information on us, please visit rbmilestone.com. And now it is my pleasure to turn it over to Neo Metals Managing Director and CEO, Chris Reed. Chris, the stage is yours. Thank you very much, Trevor, and good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Um, thank you for attending our webinar today. It gives me great pleasure uh, to not only our existing ADR shareholders uh, in the US, but potential new ones. Uh, today, I'm going to tell you how we use our core competencies in metallurgy to develop innovative solutions to produce sustainable critical materials. As Trevor alluded to, um, we are listed on the Australian Stock Exchange, um, the London Stock Exchange, and on the OTCQX. And so, yes, please speak to a licensed investment advisor should you consider. So, New Metal's purpose is to enrich the stakeholders by commercialising these innovative processes to recover critical materials from high-value waste and non-conventional feedstocks. So what we do is in commercialising our portfolio of sustainable process technologies is really looking at the recycling and recovery of these critical materials at their end of life. What we do is enable domestic circular supply chains. It delivers to our customers a sustainable competitive advantage, both in terms of cost and terms of the carbon footprint. We also have to uh, have to satisfy our customers' current and future regulatory obligations with respect to recycling recovery rates, minimum recycle content levels in the future, and as everyone is carbon conscious. So we focus on continuous R&D for our products and partnering to accelerate the commercialization through offering plant supply and or technology licensing solutions under a, a, a low cost, low risk licensing model and we're also considering where appropriate principal operations. So essentially this is, this is how we run the business. So historically we had been hard rock miners and we turned ourselves in the last decade to looking at becoming urban miners, essentially looking at those feedstocks that didn't need to be mined out of the ground. So we developed these technologies, you know, we've come up with a concept, we've put them through a disciplined stage gated development process, not unlike developing a mine. Um, but what we've done is we've increased the scale of the test work, we increase the uh, scale and the accuracy of the engineering studies. We take them up to what we call TRL six is once we've uh, finished a continuous pilot, and in the mining world, what we would call a definitive feasibility study. And then what we do is we engage to acquire an industry partner to take us down that last leg, essentially as the requirements for funding commercialization go up as with some of the skills required. Um, and we've done that certainly in the lithium ion battery business where we're now building um, a plant for Mercedes-Benz at Kuppenheim. So that's firmly in TRL eight. 
um, we've got a customer lined up for TRL9, which is our first commercial deployment, which I'm pleased to say uh, is in North America. We have two other technologies that produce battery materials, um, one being vanadium from scrap, the other one lithium. And at TRL5 is a technology that, it's the only technology that we haven't created. Uh, it's been created by some people we know well, and we're currently evaluating that. So the tactical goals for NEA metals in 2024 is to, finish the construction and commissioning of a lithium ion battery recycling plant for Mercedes Benz. Secondly, what we're gonna do is secure industrial partners, essentially to validate those technologies and take them through to the remaining levels for the lithium technology called Eli and a vanadium recovery technology. The third leg uh, of our strategy is to evaluate a move into recovering gold, or what we would call precious metals, so gold, platinum, palladium, from industrial waste streams. At the same time, to boost our cap working capital, we're looking to divest some of our hard rock um, residual mining assets uh, in Barambi and Spargos. We've also right shaped and right sized our businesses to conserve our capital. So we've reduced the headcount, um, we've reduced our overheads and we continue to do that. And we've implemented an austerity plan for the board and senior management. Whilst doing that, you know, we it, it is important to retain your best and brightest. And we do have a strong team that's been uh, with us for a long time and a great culture at Near Metals. We have a very skilled board who are the stewards of the shareholders' money. They make us jump through uh, a lot of hoops. Um, and I'm supported by some excellent business unit heads. One of the things we try to live uh, at Nia Metals uh, is our values. So one, sustainability in all the processes uh, and activities we do. Transparency, too, is important for long-term trust. Um, it's enabled us so far to last for about 21, 22 years. Respect for each other. Innovation is at our core. Discipline in terms of our evaluation and the stage-gated process. And most important, high, holding ourselves to the highest standard of ethics. Today, I'm going to focus on Primobius, which is our business. It's different from the perception of uh, battery recycling in that we are building world-class battery recycling plants for customers. At this stage, we're not proposing to act as a recycling principle. We don't worry about feed. What we do is we worry about supplying partners with the most efficient uh, plants that we possibly can. So, you know, while we moved into recycling, historically, we had developed uh, the world's second largest hard rock lithium mine. Uh, we then moved to the other end of the um, supply chain, essentially, because we could see what was rapidly becoming the fastest growers growing high value waste stream in the world. And that is these car batteries, the production scrap in the processes, warranty returns and end of life arisings that we're seeing. So, you know, in terms of a growth rate, it's growing at a compound rate of 25% per annum. Um, it's going to be a huge industry towards the end of this decade and certainly for the decades to come. Um, you know, recycling in the West and particularly in Europe has become mandatory. And that's really around um, creating security of supply and to make battery production more environmentally sustainable. So as I alluded to, you know, our, our main business is supplying plants uh, in partnership with a global plant builder. So what we've done is we've established a plant building joint venture, which is called Primobius GmbH, a German incorporated joint venture. 
um, separately, you know, the business model, apart from making margins on plant supply agreements to third parties, is that we license our technology. So we have an Australian IP holding company so that we get two different streams of revenue that have two different um, types. One's more of an annuity, one's a bit more lumpy. But most importantly, our partner, SMS Group, is a 150-year-old German plant builder, 14,000 employees in 95 sites around the world, um, production workshops in Europe, North America, India, and China. So what we've done is we developed the technology. We've taken it up to TRL6. We've done a partnership with the Germans because that was what we needed to do for success for us was to deploy as many plants and generate as many royalties as we can. So what we did is we established, even during COVID, our own lithium ion battery disposal service in Hilkenbach in Germany. So we currently dispose of batteries for the German uh, EV supply chain. That's enabled us to form a partnership and be picked as Mercedes-Benz technology partner. Currently, we are building them a 2,500 ton per annum pilot plant at Kuppenheim in Germany and entered into a long-term research and development collaboration. Separately, we have issued a number of licenses for our technology um, and we will supply those licensees with plants. So we've signed a, a, a license agreement with Steel Company of Canada, um, an Australian company called Redivium uh, in Europe. So our plants, why people buy our plants? Because we can deliver them a long-term sustainable competitive advantage. So it's a, essentially a three-stage process. The first part is the discharging and dismantling of the battery packs. We then shred them uh, in, and recover the black mass that has the uh, recoverable anode and cathode materials. We separate out the plastic steel casings and metal foils. We then put them into our patented process. We've got four national phase patents granted and 13 pending. Um, and what we're, enabled, what we're able to do then is get to the nickel, the cobalt, uh, the manganese, the lithium, and able to reuse those in the production of new batteries. Um, we recovered the graphite and uh, our main tailings product. Uh, and one of the novel parts of our technology is that we produce a, a fertilizer as our tailings product, which is uh, ammonium sulfate. And for that, you know, we were recognized and made the finals of the German National Sustainability Award. But getting back to the sustainable competitive advantage, one, we satisfy our customers' requirements in terms of license to operate. Um, meeting those minimum recycling efficiencies, which are very high bars in Europe, uh, to low cost. Because we recover all of those byproducts, lithium is the main and the most strategic uh, element that we recover. It carries the electrons from the positive to the negative in the battery. So once you sell the byproducts, what you're able to do is get the lithium, the net lithium cost uh, down at the bottom end of the cost curve and you have a sustainable competitive advantage. And because we're actually recycling the batteries and we are not uh, mining, essentially we're able to strip out about 85% of the carbon footprint. In terms of a license to operate, and that's obviously what uh, Mercedes-Benz have to operate under Europe, you know, you have to hit recovery rates of 90% in 2027 and 95% by 2031. Um, carbon footprint declaration is compulsory and then the next set of hurdles that the Europeans have created for themselves is to meet these um, minimum recycles of uh, minimum levels of recycled content sorry it is 4 30 in the morning here and um, and so this is a this is a very high bar for them to reach you know Europe's not blessed with the natural resources that North America or Australia has so they've essentially got to create fortress Europe and trap it in there so that's a fantastic tailwind um, for our business development pipeline they've also put in another act um, 
the Critical Raw Materials Act that was passed, I think, in March or April 2024. And now they've set themselves a target that is significantly above what was in the earlier battery regulations. Uh, so that 25% of production of any of those commodities uh, in Europe needs to be from recycled content. Now, most importantly, when you're dealing with the car making supply chain is low cost. Uh, so we enable the customers to essentially recover the metals that they would lose in the conventional recycling model. So the conventional recyclers in North America would buy batteries off the uh, car makers. So the car makers or cell makers would lose the custody of those materials. They would get some cash back, but that doesn't help you in terms of your supply chain security. So we enable the uh, owner of our plant to recover back their materials that they would otherwise lose uh, and, and make more money. So essentially they would pay the operating costs, they would pay a 10% royalty on the value of what's recovered. And so their net cost um, would give them the advantage that you see on the right-hand side with respect to lithium. And, you know, everyone these days is a lot more carbon conscious and um, so, you know, recycling reduces the need to mine virgin materials. And uh, fortunately, we are able in a life cycle assessment by Minviro um, to reduce about 85% of the carbon footprint uh, from mining new materials. So, you know, we're very happy with that. So the rationale behind our business model uh, and going into plant supply and licensing is, you know, you've got this huge wave of supply that's that, that's coming to the market. Who is actually going to be able to supply the plants to the people that need them at the size and the scale that's, that will be required? Um, you know, there are other recyclers, Glencore, Umacore, the like, um, but they won't build third-party plants. Um, we will build a plant for you. We will enable you to get all your materials back uh, and you can get your key ingredient down at the bottom end of the cost curve. So for us, it's capital light and low risk. So, you know, rather than tying up capital with the normal hockey stick payoff diagrams, what we're able to do is to make money upfront from the plant supply agreement. And then um, once we build the plant, commission it, and it goes into production, then the return starts to look more like a royalty or an annuity stream. But, you know, we we, are, we do appreciate the battery materials prices have been volatile just to show what's happened, you know, the reduction in the current prices. We get, you know, we get margin, uh, our customers get margin compression and, uh, and we get compression on our royalty returns. But fortunately, you know, the long-term forecasts are for battery materials to uh, improve from their current levels. Um, and so everyone gets back to winning. In terms of where the business is, it's 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 hard to overemphasize how important you know Mercedes Benz uh, is to the Prime Mobius business. So you know they are a marquee uh, OEM. Um, we've entered into uh, a long-term cooperation agreement and R and D collaboration. We uh, are currently. Uh, constructing and we'll soon start commissioning this quarter uh, the front part of um, this 2,500 tonne per annum pilot plant, which is at their Kuppenheim operation uh, in Western Germany. So Mercedes-Benz, you know, they produce about 2.4 million cars to electrify that. They're going to need about 200 gigawatt hours of cells or about 900,000 tons of cells going into the cars and that'll generate sort of one to 200,000 tons of scrap. So, you know, that's a very, very big market to start off with for the production scrap. That's at a sort of a 10 to 20% uh, scrap rate to start off with. Um, and then that'll transition into larger volumes as those cars come back at end of life. In terms of the next step, so Mercedes-Benz industrial uh, validation and two, then moving to full commercial deployment. And I'm pleased to say that we've licensed Steel Company of Canada um, in North America for batteries attached to end-of-life vehicles. Um, 
we will offer them a plant by 30 June 2025. And um, so what we've done there, we'll get a 10% gross revenue royalty that's subject to some hurdles in terms of IRR. Um, and we've also retained the option to buy into up to 50% equity in that recycling SPV. So we want to be product ready uh, by the end of the second uh, quarter in uh, 2025. Uh, and then we've moved to license in certain jurisdictions in, in Europe, uh, a company called Redivium and Critical Metals. We are the largest shareholder in both of those companies. So importantly for shareholders, you know, the upcoming catalysts and sort of financial milestones, you know, fortunately Mercedes-Benz for us is, is de-risking our business model and our technology. It's about a 33 million euro contract that, uh, that we have with them. So, you know, as we get to, get to the end of the first half of 2024, you know, we are still installing the plant. Obviously, you could see uh, at that facility in the second half to complete the installation and to start commissioning, reaching production in the first half of 2025 and then getting that to steady state. We'll then move on to our R&D collaboration where we'll work with Mercedes on the latest and greatest cell chemistries and formats. We'll co-own the improvements on those. Most importantly, it allows us to go to the next stage, which is our 21,000 ton integrated design, 50 tons per day throughput. Um, you know, so we are looking to, to offer Stelco that by 30 June 2025, subject to receiving their purchase order, we'll then move into the fabrication installation and to start commissioning that in uh, at the start of 2027. We've then got designs to look at a larger end of life plant. So for every gigafactory that's going around uh, of about a 35 gigawatt hour site, you will need uh, one to two of our smaller plants to handle the production scrap, and then you will need a 200,000 tonne plant to take the end of life arisings. We won't really need those until towards the end of the decade, um, but certainly the volume and the market is coming at us very, very rapidly. In terms of some of our other uh, technologies that we've developed, we developed a lithium chemical technology, our background um, Originally gold mining, then we moved into uh, lithium uh, before we moved into recycling. So we've still got some residual lithium processing skills. And in terms uh, of, of this slide, it's our ELI processing technology. We own 70% of this technology with one of Australia's largest mining companies, Mineral Resources, who was our original partner at Mount Marion. So what that technology does, it enables lithium brines either from solar evaporation or the new direct lithium extraction techniques to go straight through a purification and electrolysis process, straight through to lithium hydroxide, which the battery, which the cathode makers need to, to, to make cathodes that go into the cells that go into the electric vehicles. And, and what we do is we replace the need to bring in imported expensive reagents like soda ash and caustic soda. So we essentially use electricity and potentially renewable electricity to unbind the lithium from the chloride and to migrate across a membrane and become lithium hydroxide. We've done a number of studies and it, 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 what it'll do is the, it'll, it'll reduce the cost of producing lithium hydroxide from a brine deposit where 60% of the world's lithium is by about two thirds. Um, it has a significant capital cost advantage um, and it's, we expect that it'll have a massive uh, advantage in terms of reducing the carbon footprint. So what we're doing at the moment is um, in the second half of this year, and perhaps in, in June, is to start the final stage of a pilot program that we've been running for a year, which will electrolyze solutions that we have purified from an operating lithium brine deposit down in South America. So we've got results, uh, both in terms of the uh, success of that 
uh, in terms of purities, uh, consumption, and we'll update the engineering cost studies and re-verify uh, our operating cost advantage. We'll look to deploy this uh, under a technology licensing business model and secure a, a industrial partner uh, to prove it at scale. We've also got a vanadium uh, recovery technology. Now, vanadium is one of the leading chemistries for stationary energy storage. So they actually store electricity uh, in a liquid. It's a vanadium solution. These batteries are being deployed all around the world, uh, sort of led by China, uh, probably second followed by Japan, Europe, and then North America. So we developed the technology internally and we've done it fully piloted it uh, and done the engineering cost studies. Essentially what we do is we can get steel slags that have the world's highest grade vanadium content in them. And we can use a very environmentally friendly process with captured CO2 to tease that vanadium out and produce very, very high purity vanadium at the bottom end of the cost curve. Unfortunately for us, um, putting out the study in, uh, in March uh, of 2023, um, the price then dropped uh, by about 50% in the ensuing six months. So despite uh, getting our environmental approvals, a feedstock agreement from SSAB, an offtake agreement with Glencore, debt uh, financing cornerstone by the European Investment Bank, when the commodity price drops by 50%, there's not a lot of equity holders. So what we've done is we've sort of parked that at the moment. And now what we're going to do is look to exploit in a technology licensing business model by engaging directly with the slag owners who are essentially steel makers. Um, what I did just gloss over then was the fact that we can actually have a negative carbon footprint uh, for that vanadium because we use captured CO2. The next technology I'm going to tell you about is, is the first one that we have not ever invented and, and um, incubated at Near Metals, but is uh, a precious metals recovery technology uh, owned by a third party. Um, you know, in terms of diversification, you know, we have a number of projects. Um, so we're diversified in the field of battery materials, but battery materials themselves haven't performed that well as a commodity group over the last 18 months. And that's been reflected in our share price. And so, you know, what we've chosen to do is to look at R&D into uh, an uncorrelated uh, field, which is precious metals and precious metals are we spent our first decade of our life as gold mining. It's interesting to return back to it, uh, this time not developing a mine and just doing the processing out of stockpiles. So we're evaluating this patent pending process um, to use as principal and generate short-term uh, cash flows. What we've been doing is running a, a we've run a six-week pilot plant program uh, in Denver, uh, looking at different types of feedstocks, uh, looking at uh, different combinations of reagents, different recovery methods um, at, on different feedstocks. And uh, so we've completed that. We're compiling the, uh, the results there and we're soon to start a, uh, we've identified what we, what we think are the best conditions. And then we're looking to confirm that in a second round of test work that will start imminently. Um, and look, you know, the, like I said, the, the, the move into precious metals is to reduce that correlation with the, essentially the lithium price um, into something that's uncorrelated, um, you know, but consistent with our um, core competency, which is metallurgy in particular, hydrometallurgy. And so, you know, we're going to look to commercialize this innovative solution um, that can recover precious metals out of a high value waste stream. So in summary, you know, I, I hope you've gleaned that sustainability, um, you know, is our core. You know, we, we have looking at developing these solutions uh, that will help the circular economy uh, and, and a circular supply chain for these critical materials. Um, you know, for this, we've been recognised, we have a... Um, an MSCI triple B rating uh, for ESG. We've got the green economy mark from the London Stock Exchange. We won the best new technology in 2022. Um, you know, but certainly, you know, we do care for the environment. 
um, our people are one of our focus. Um, we are conscious of working in the community and we give back. And uh, we, like I said, we hold ourselves to the highest standards of ethics and accountability. So, you know, I believe we do have a very unique value proposition um, to shareholders, you know. So we are at the forefront of low carbon production of these circular supply chains for critical materials, you know, because we have focused at the other end of the supply chain, which is on recycling and recovery from waste. You know, we have, that is our clear strategy. You know, we, we are recognized for our environmentally friendly processes. You know, we do the disciplined technical test work and engineering cost studies so that we can warrant to our customers that we do we can deliver them a sustainable competitive advantage and obviously we share some of that in the way we make returns um, industrial validation and partnering with very strong partners is a key part of our strategy uh, to reduce the risk and maximize our return on invested capital we've got smart business models you know for the right opportunities yes we can take on more risk in terms of joint ventures and principal operations but you know in the current market our low risk technology licensing business model and or plant supply um, are serving as well and diversification so both in the fields of battery materials and now looking to widen that uh, into precious metals so as I alluded to before, what I've got is our share price uh, against the lithium price index, you know, and, and in 2015 uh, through to 2019, we were lithium producers and then our main business is lithium battery production. So, you know, despite uh, transitioning into um, operations in terms of constructing plants and then we run our own um, battery disposal service, um, you know, that that correlation of about 0.9 with the lithium price has been very, very hard to shake. And the fact that that's dropped about 90% uh, has not been enjoyable. But, you know, it, this is not the first time we've been through the cycle. And fortunately, the forecasts are for the prices to move higher. So in terms of, you know, cash, we have about 14 million Australian dollars and 17 million in investments, no debt. Um, we have a pretty stable uh, group of shareholders in terms of the top 20 and uh, and we're covered by RBC, Euros, Hartleys in Australia and Cavendish. So thank you very much everyone for listening to my presentation. Uh, I'm now certainly very happy, Trevor, to, to take some questions. Thank you, Chris. And so as Chris mentioned, we will open it up to the Q&A session. If you do have any questions, again, you can submit them in the Q&A module. Let's kick off with some questions that were submitted during the registration process. Um, some that you have already addressed in detail, but you know it doesn't hurt to reiterate, Chris. Uh, what are the catalysts that we should look out for as you finish construction for Mercedes on the recycling plant? And, and why is this facility so strategically significant? Yeah, sure. So, um, you know what you'll what you'll look for is um, you know updates from near metals on a quarterly basis of, of progress on how that facility is going. So, like I said, you know moving from construction to commissioning the the front part of the plant uh, this quarter, starting to commission uh, the back the refinery section of the plant towards the end of next quarter. Uh, then working towards start of production, then steady state. Um, and that really culminates and the strategic importance of the industrial validation culminates in us offering Stelco the next scale of plant. So going from 2,500 tonnes of plant to 20 odd thousand tonnes of capacity. So it's an important de-risking uh, event for us, for Primobius and for our partners. So, you know, what, what Primobius is the front facing uh, plant delivery business to the customers. And then what we do is we get SMS, our partner to build them under a back-to-back -back arrangement. So it's sort of symbiotic in that once Mercedes works, SMS are happy building bigger plants and then we're happy. We would say, well, we've reached product readiness. We will now start to offer them to, well, 
first of all, we'll offer Stelco. Uh, we've got an MOU with the Tochu in Japan. And then we've got a nice business development pipeline of, of confidential uh, parties. Everyone's very, very happy that uh, Mercedes-Benz is uh, plowing the waves and uh, piloting that technology for us. At, uh, well, it's industry val industrially validating the technology for us. And that should presumably pave a, a clearer path of, you know, start to end when it comes to building these plants. So from a timeline perspective, uh, it should be a, a little clearer um, on that path. Um, do you anticipate perhaps uh, a reduction in cost during these processes? So, you know, one of the fantastic things is that Mercedes-Benz is actually paying for the plant. Um, the money that we make, we actually plough back uh, into the R&D uh, over the duration of the R&D collaboration agreement. Um, and like I said, the, the first big commercial returns for us are from the, the Stelco plant. So I think, you know, in, in terms of what that'll look like, um, you know, we'll have for Stelco a contract value. Um, we would then at the appropriate time put out earnings guidance, uh, you know, around what we make out of that contract. Um, and then in terms of transitioning to 10% royalties, when we design a plant, um, it's for a certain feed, it'll produce a certain, yeah, when I say a certain feed, a certain type of cell chemistry. Then at the recoveries, we'll be able to very accurately estimate what the products that will come out of the back end and you can apply the various pricings. So we get eight products out of every plant. Uh, so a 10% royalty on eight products, the top five are lithium, nickel, cobalt, copper, and aluminium. Now you can hedge those on the LMA. Um, so, you know, a plant that'll last 25 years to a tier one customer with a, with a known feed and known production of, of eight products we think should attract a superior PE. Um, obviously the PE you get for the plant supply part of the business won't be as high it's more lumpy but you know i i, I doubt that there'll be many uh, royalty companies that would be able to as accurately produce what will come out of the back end appreciate that chris and is the key recycling advantage would you say it's the technology or the business model so you know it's it it's it's a combination of both, Trevor. So you know the plants do a job. Uh, they recover at very very high efficiencies. They will give you that sustainable competitive advantage. They will reduce your carbon footprint. Now, there, at, at, as far as we're aware, there is only one other company in the West that is offering the uh, to to do to build a, a refinery. We're offering a complete um, sort of end of life pack through to end product offering. So our flow sheet has granted patents on them. So people can't replicate exactly what we replicate. Uh, they may do it better. They may do it worse. The biggest recyclers are in China. None of them are, are, are in the business of supplying third party plants. So that's that's good for us. Um, and, you know, we believe and, and on what we can, uh, on what's publicly discoverable that, you know, we have leading recovery rates um, in terms, and we being a public company, we actually publish the costs that a plant maker or a plant owner can get. Uh, and we've published um, an independent life cycle analysis for the carbon footprint. So in terms of, uh, the product, yes, we have some sustainable competitive advantages from our point of view because we have granted patents on them. Now, in terms of um, the second part of the question, the business models, we're able to provide a recycling service for a fee. If, if someone wanted to enter into, if it was a tier one car maker that wanted a 25 year recycling service, we would consider a structure there where we could use, you know, we could deploy the technology and provide that service to them. We could do it as a joint venture. Um, 
you know, because they would own, they, they would contribute long-term feedstocks. And I think that that's one of the problems that we see if you were starting a merchant recycling operation. Where, where do you get the feedstocks to achieve steady state operation? The majority of the capital and operating costs are not in the dismantling, discharging or shredding. It is in the hydrometallurgical refinery. They need to be operating at a very, very high rate to achieve the cost outcomes that we project. So security of supply and feedstock uh, is paramount. Um, and we just don't want to get into that. It's it's a risk that we we worked out to start off with. You know, ultimately, like in the US, there's an overcapacity in the shredding. There's an undercapacity in refining. And that's resulted in fierce competition and paying for sales. In, in terms of where we are in Europe, uh, we've taken a little bit more quieter approach and we get paid to dispose of the batteries. Um, we show the car makers, if you have a plant like we're operating at a larger scale, you can achieve these, bring your batteries and we'll show you. Um, and, you know, all car makers want lowest costs. And, you know, for, for I guess the Chinese have showed us that being integrated works for the EV success. Elon uh, has done that with Tesla um, in terms of, you know, if you, if you want to put alpha back in the car making, you've got to make EVs, you've got to make your own cells and be as integrated as you can. Um, and, you know, they, the Tesla spawned, I guess, uh, an independent company called Redwood with some of their technical team that have developed recycling through to cathode and anode production. Well, I don't think they're yet, but they certainly will get there. Um, and and likewise, you know, the car makers um, will, they, they have in Europe the primary responsibility to recycle their product. So they either got to pay someone or to do it themselves. Um, there's also a security of supply. Like there's a China controls 80% of the EV battery material supply chains. So it's Europe's been the biggest importer of cells for the last four or five years. The US is big. The Europe is is probably a couple of years ahead, perhaps maybe two years ahead in terms of the gigafactory build out, but the US is coming quick. Uh, and will overtake Europe, my, my guess is, you know, towards the end of the decade. Um, so, Chris, I, I appreciate the overview on uh, the uh, battery recycling business model, you know, the funding mechanisms, uh, the the importance of having strategics in there. Perhaps you can discuss a little bit more of the strategy around funding and the business model, uh, at least high level, related to the other technologies, the other businesses. Yeah, sure. So, you know, the other two technologies we're looking to exploit under a technology licensing business model. So we're not looking to deploy any large amounts of capital there. In terms of Eli and finishing off that pilot, um, Eli has funds in it um, to complete the balance of its work planned for 2024 without any recourse to us. Uh, Eli is, uh, sorry, the vanadium recovery is, uh, is um you know, in terms of next financial year, really it's just a small amount in terms of business development and engagement directly with the steel companies. So that's a very, very small outflow, you know, a, a more meaningful outflow um, in terms of R&D ha has been the precious metals. Um, you know, we're, we're evaluating that technology with a view that we may use it as principal to develop a short-term cash flow. So, you know, I think in, in, in this market, you know, we've, we've done one capital raising in the last 12 years. Uh, we've always been able to use our own funds in taking those technologies through and de-risking them through the TRL levels to six and, and with the battery recycling beyond there. Um, so the other technologies are at level six. We would get an industrial partner to take them through to commercialization. The, the precious metals, like I said, we, we would look to um, the strategy there is um, precious metals are something that we understand well. Um, 
for, you know, I was I was born into a mining family, sort of four generations, uh, born and bred in Kaguli, which is a gold mining capital of Australia. So precious metals is something that we understand well. Um, and certainly the ability to generate a cash flow in the short term um, before the funds start flowing from uh, Prime Mobius and the IP royalties in in sort of 26, 27 is, is important for us. And I think it's uh, it goes without saying that the, the team and the personnel and the expertise uh, behind the advancements from you know early stages TRL through uh, to full commercialization and rollout are, are extremely important. So, you know, you've you've obviously developed an impressive portfolio of technologies. Would you be able to provide some a little bit more clarity on the team and how important they are and the strategic support that you have and how they're being utilized for each of these? technologies yeah sure so you know the the businesses uh nominally sit in in silos in terms of the business heads you saw there so uh, christian who runs a battery recycling spent 10 years with mercedes-benz working on the first evs and and four years at uh, volkswagen as a head of recycling um i've got darren townsend uh looking after uh the precious metals um Mike Tamlin, uh, who's, who's a, a lithium industry expert, looking after Eli, and um, uh, they're the sort of nominal heads, but sort of the disciplines that we have sitting sitting underneath that, um, you know, really center around uh, the process engineers, metallurgists, chemists. Um, so we do we do we do all the metallurgy uh, in house, uh, and we do a lot of a uh, lot of the engineering in house, and that that is really uh, the core competency. So we're not holding ourselves out as geologists or mining engineers. Or that we've we've picked a very very discreet uh, part of the supply chain in terms of the uh, adapting our sort of pedigree and mineral processing, but applying those to different feedstocks. So the same processes, um, if I have a look at, you know, battery, the, the, the lithium ion battery recycling, essentially they're base metals and lithium in a can. Now um, they're very, very high grade. So your typical nickel grade could be 2%, you know, in a battery it's 15%. Right, so we've had to design a hydrometallurgical refinery that handles, you know, it's a, it's a different ore body, right? It's uh, there are elements that aren't found in nature, so you know, it it's it's not easy. If it was easy, everyone would would do it. Um, but you know, we've got a fantastic uh, board in terms of you know covering all the relevant disciplines, and um, you know, and and they hold us to our discipline stage gate. Uh, evaluations. Exciting technology, obviously, on the uh, battery recycling side, uh, Promobius and, uh, you know, the partnership with with them and uh, you being the technology partner for Mercedes. Um, is it safe to say the divestment with Barambi uh, and the expected cash flows coming from the precious metals should be supportive uh, and allocated towards, say, your flagship growth uh, on Eli, as well as the recycling side? Yeah, so look, I think uh, certainly Eli and the VRP are in technology licensing business models, so there's not a, a massive amount of cash uh, from that. In terms of funding that br the bridge until when we get into positive cash flows, certainly the disposal of of Barambi and uh, and generating short term cash flow from precious metals production is our answer to it. So we'll take a couple more questions here. Appreciate that, Chris. Uh, it, it does appear that you guys are very closely correlated to the lithium price. How does NMT Neo Metals think about diversification away from battery materials price volatility? I feel like you, you did touch on this already, but doesn't yeah. matter. Really, right? Look, I think, you know, fortunately, we can actually execute these under technology licensing arrangements, right, which is low cost, low risk. You, you, it would be even worse if you had an operation and the lithium price dropped 90%, right? Like that could be a near-death experience. 
So in terms of reducing that correlation, you know, precious metals and lithium are uncorrelated. I think when I had a look at it, it was about 0 0.02. So, you know, introducing a precious metals operation into that, uh, I, I guess, how you would value the business into that valuation model really should break that positive, you know, uh, at point nine. I mean, it's the most, one of the most strongly positively correlated companies I've seen, but I mean, it's understandable. It's enjoyable on the way up. Um, you know, in 2022, we, we reached, you know, $1.1 $1 billion market cap, you know, since in that ensuing time, you know, we've, We've, we're building the plant for Mercedes-Benz. We're de-risking. We've advanced the business. Um, but, you know, the, the prices have collapsed and we can see that that reduction in battery materials prices reduces the corporate valuation, right? There's, there's, no way to, there's no way to duck that. But the business is fundamentally much better. It's just much, much cheaper. So, like I said, enjoyable on the way up not so enjoyable on the way down. The The only way to arrest that is to actually generate an uncorrelated cash flow. Well said, Chris. And uh, let's end off on uh, just a, a quick summary uh, of Neo Metals near-term milestones that investors can look forward to. Yeah, certainly. So, you know, in, in terms of this quarter, we would have results of the test work coming out of the, the precious metals. Uh, an announcement that we've started um, the uh, final stage of the pilot plant for Eli uh, in terms of Mercedes-Benz. I mean, look, you know, they're a customer. We can only say what they'll let us say, but we would we would give updates um, quarterly as we, uh, we have to do periodic reporting on how that's progressing. But, you know, all eyes... And I think what will make material um, improvements uh, in the share price is when we start to deliver uh, some more of those business development opportunities for you know plants number three, four, and five, and really, really define that. Uh, obviously, the seminal moment is going to be uh, the offering of a plant to Stelco. Thank you, Chris. And thank you, everyone, for joining today's event. As a reminder, please keep an eye out for Neometals Brief Investor Survey, which we'll be emailing you all shortly. For your opinions, uh, or when it comes to your opinions, it's extremely important to us and management when it comes to the uh, really understanding of the investor communication efforts and, and really guiding the focus of future events. So again, we do appreciate your participation there. Today's recording will soon be made available on the company's website at neometals.com.au. And any additional questions can be sent to neometals at rbmilestone.com. Again, that's neometals at rbmilestone.com. That concludes today's event. Hope you all have a great rest of your day. You can now disconnect. Thank you.